I'm so glad to spend uh, another 15 minutes of your day uh, focused together on the Word of God and and to really kind of be calibrated and uh, strengthened, rooted, and grounded in uh, in in our love for, and faith in Jesus. And uh, you know we're we're working our way through the Book of Acts, and uh, in today's lesson we're in the Book of Acts. We're going to pick up in Peter's sermon that he preaches on at Pentecost. This is the first sermon that is uh, preached in the age of the church, and uh, we're going to pick it up in chapter 2, verse 24 in just a second. But first, uh, let's pray, and we'll get into the Word of God, and, and hopefully I can close with some encouraging words uh, for you for your day today. Let's pray. Oh, what a mighty God you are, faithful and true and good and all things are possible that that conform and that reflect your glory. And yet, Lord, there are things that, that you don't necessarily do that you could do. But I love you and I praise you on behalf of all of us that gather here that, that everything that pertains to our uh, creation, our fall, and the ability and the offer of redemption in Christ and glorification in Christ uh, in, in eternity, you have revealed all these things that we might know and be assured that you are good. And so would you speak now and call us to yourself, adopt us, uh, meld us to you through your Son, and grant us peace that passes all understanding. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts chapter 2, and remember, Peter is preaching after the, the Holy Spirit has come, and there have been there's been this sound of a mighty rushing wind and this looking the appearance of flames upon each of the the 120 gathered and also, uh, they're speaking the 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 mag the mighty works of God, the magnificent works of God, in all these various languages. So the people are hearing and and perhaps for the first time beginning to get a a sense of God's purpose and plan in the world. And and so uh, we we've looked at uh, um, the foretelling of Jesus, and now we're getting into. Uh, the the work that he accomplished, and we looked at that yesterday when when it said, uh, "Men of Israel, hear these words: Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God." And and he re, uh, asserts and establishes the the reliability that the, the the human being Jesus is none other than the living God, the second person of the Trinity, who has taken taken on flesh, become one of us. And so, picking up in verse twenty four, it says this: God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, in Psalm 16, by the way, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades. Or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Now, as I referred to, that is a, uh, one of the Psalms of David in Psalm uh, 16. And, and it's really speaking of the, the promise of God's protection, God's presence, uh, God's strengthening. Uh, the, the certainty that his circumstances will not have the final say of his not only day, but destiny, uh, but the plan and purpose of God will, and and that God unfolds before David uh, in, in a sense, a, a, a vision and understanding of the, of the path of life that will unfold before him. And this path of life, as it is walked, he says in verse 28, will cause him and causes us to be full of gladness in God's presence. Now, why would Peter be uh, stirred and prompted by the Holy Spirit to, to draw upon the insight of Psalm 16 when he is talking about the suffering, the death, 
the crucifixion and death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And, and he's, he's wanting to establish the certainty, the certainty of the promise, but the certainty of the performance of Jesus. A couple things that he says here in verse 24, that uh, though Jesus was buried, meaning put into the grave, he was raised. And though he was dead, he is alive. And, and so Peter wants to make it very clear that Jesus truly did die. He died a real death and is now alive. And his corpse went through the process of a real burial, and yet he was raised. And so he's trying to establish that the death of Jesus is a historical certainty, and the resurrection of Jesus is a historical certainty. And he is trying to proclaim without a shadow of a doubt. And this is this is eyewitnesses to this reality. And there are people that would have heard rumors about this. And Peter is trying to establish it. We sit 2,000 years later and we sit back scholarly and we criticize or we critique, we, we analyze. And, and yet here we have firsthand witnesses saying that he was truly dead but made alive. And he was uh, truly buried but he was raised. And... And what this is pointing at, and this is the connection to Psalm 16, no created power, no earthly power can withstand the power of God or is greater than God's heavenly power. We always must remember that created power is subservient to the creator of that power. And therefore, God who created life and God who pronounced judgment of death, God holds in his hands the power of life and death and has triumphed over it in Jesus. We need not, and, and, and I know we do, even those of us that are just the strongest of believers, there's a sense in which we all fear the unknown of death. And Peter here is saying that we need not fear. And that's the, the beauty of this, this, the way he ends in verse 28. You have made known to me the paths of life. You've pointed the way. You've shown me the path. And you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Not only as I walk the pilgrim way of this path and by faith in Jesus will there be fullness of gladness, but there will be fullness of gladness as I arrive at the destination that this path is leading me to. And so this is a glorious and great promise that David is uh, uh, understanding ahead of time. And Peter is now interpreting its significance. And I want to just point something out. It's interesting here because as uh, all of these things that uh, uh, David foretold become fulfilled in Jesus. As all is fulfilled, it's because it was foretold by David through the prompting of God. And and there's a, a verse, you know, if you've read your Bible, sometimes we read through these verses so fast and we miss some really insightful and important voice, verses. And there's a verse in Amos, Old Testament prophet, little book, Amos chapter 3, verse 7. I want to read it for you. It says this, Surely the sovereign Lord, remember here we have power, sovereign Lord, all powerful God. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Now let me read that again and, and let the weight and the reality of what these words are plainly stating sink in. He says this, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Now, we might be tempted to think then that God can't do anything without telling us ahead of time through the prophets. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the plans that God purposes, and the plan here in the Hebrew is a technical reference to plans for our deliverance, for our rescue, for our redemption. And so here we must see when it says, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophet. He's saying God will do nothing 
in human history for the benefit and the rescue and the achievement of our salvation that he will not and has not revealed through the prophets. And therefore, we can read, this is an invitation as we go back into the Old Testament, to read the Old Testament as a uh, uh, something that is going to reveal the promise, is revealing promises and foretelling of realities that will be achieved and fulfilled, accomplished and finished in Jesus. That's why uh, Peter here, you read the letters of Paul, you read the book of Hebrews, you read the book of Revelation, you read the New Testament uh, letters beyond the Gospels, and even in the ministry of Jesus, so much of the Old Testament is quoted. And it's quoted because there is a connective tissue or fiber or thread to the promises made in the prophets that are aiming at revealing what Jesus would be would fulfill and accomplish and achieve for our salvation. Peter is really driving this home here. And so he says, God, verse 24, raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Jesus came to be a triumphant savior. And he wants to be the triumphant savior in your life. He wants to be the one that can display that he, too, can win victory in your life and assert victory in your life and, and display the achievement of his victory in your life. Would you surrender and allow Jesus to have this victory in your life? Let's pray. Lord, you are not hindered by our sin. You've triumphed over it. You are not halted by death. You've defeated death. Therefore, we have in you nothing to fear because you have conquered sin and death. And you have conquered and defeated and disarmed the devil. And so, Lord, really, the option and the opportunity we are left is to waller in our misery that has been vanquished and live blindly and wade and stumble through life, thinking there is no hope upon, uh, except what I can make, or we can trust you and enter into the fullness of joy in your presence. Oh God, welcome us in. And I pray that truly in these moments, those joining in this lesson in this moment, God, and beyond that we would encounter and know you in this way and so be freed and to enter into the fullness of joy. It's found in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, may, may the Lord work in your heart today because I don't know what kind of a challenge you might face today, what kind of scary things you're awaiting on. Maybe some of, some of you are awaiting word. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe we'll get a phone call today, but whatever it is that we will face, whatever fears that we endure, whatever insecurities seem to, to kind of rear their ugly head again in our life, let us be reminded by the Holy Spirit that if we are adopted and redeemed in Jesus, that we are held securely in his hands. And so may you live and walk in that abiding peace and joy and presence of being in God's perfect care. I will see you again. God bless you. See you tomorrow.